The Navy traded power for convenience, on purpose. The F-14D had long legs, APG-71 reach, Phoenix in the quiver, and a RIO orchestrating targets beyond the horizon. Yet the fleet stepped away. In this video, we'll lay out the uncomfortable reason why. Maintenance burden, corrosion, wiring, hydraulics, and the logistics footprint outpaced budgets and sortie demands. Then we'll contrast that with the unrealized Super Tomcat 21 package, cleaner aerodynamics, conformal fuel, digital controls that promised endurance without the pain. How much performance did the Navy knowingly leave on the table? Before we move on, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel and like the video. If the Tomcat could see farther and fly longer, why did the accountants win the air war? The late 1990s Navy had a problem set that rewarded predictability. Carrier air wings faced sustained sortie tempo from presence missions and no-fly zone policing, while budgets stayed flat and aircraft aged simultaneously. The F-14 delivered on-station reach without tanker overhead, which mattered when decks cycled day after day and the target area sat hundreds of miles from the ship. But sortie math did not end with fuel and missiles. It started with whether the jet could make the launch. The maintenance reality drove that answer. A variable sweep wing adds pivots, gloves, seals, and actuators that require inspection and lubrication, and they sit over a salt bath. Hydraulic lines ran long, powered heavy surfaces and leaked when fittings aged. Wiring looms grew brittle. Corrosion control on a steel and saltwater carrier deck became a standing task, not a scheduled event, and every arrestment loaded the structure you had just cleared. Hours of wrenching per flight hour were not a scare line. They were the daily rhythm of keeping the jet safe. Cost per flight hour and maintenance man hours per flight hour told the story in a way a commander could brief. The Tomcat family, A, B, and D, sat on the high side of both measures, and the F-A 18C, designed with modular avionics and easier access panels, set the affordability baseline. If you add the labor, parts, fluids, and test equipment for one F-14 flight hour, then compare it to an equivalent Hornet hour, you got fewer ready jets for the same money and people. You also saw more variability, which hurts when the air wing must hit a fixed cycle. The crew model added capability and cost at the same time. A pilot and a RIO improved sensor tasking and accountability, and they closed the loop faster in complex stacks. But training two aviators per jet multiplied syllabi, simulator time, and currency events. Sustainment lines doubled in places that rarely make headlines. Spare ejection seats, survival gear, cockpit displays, test sets, and the inventory of boxes that supported the second station. It was like trying to run a Le Mans prototype on a rental car budget cycle. The airframe could lap the field when conditions were right. But the pit stops, the parts, and the specialized crew did not match a fleet that needed the same outcome every day with constrained inputs. Reports from the oversight era captured the fleet's workarounds. Parts cannibalization spiked as squadrons kept a few aircraft flying by borrowing from others, and mission-capable percentages dipped when inspections uncovered corrosion or wiring faults that demanded dockyard time. None of that was dramatic, and all of it was cumulative. By this point, the bill had a shape. Corrosion crept into fasteners and bays, wiring age produced intermittent faults that stole hours of troubleshooting, and legacy hydraulics taxed maintainers with leaks and contamination checks. Each inspection cycle lengthened, turnaround time slipped, and availability shrank to a number planners could not trust. So, with that anti-climax established, we can now move on to how the Tomcat tried to earn its keep in a different role. The interceptor that wasn't supposed to drop bombs became the carrier's precision striker when the A6 left. How? The pivot started with land iron. A targeting pod hung under the fuselage. Cabling routed through new harnesses, and cockpit video piped onto displays the jet had not been born with. Crews got a laser designator, a stabilized infrared view, and symbology that tied sensors to coordinates. The change moved fast because the gap was obvious. The air wing needed a platform that could find, identify, and guide weapons with its own laser, then stay on station long enough to service more than one target. 
the F-14's legs made the endurance part simple. Wiring and software made the rest possible. There was a catch. The radar and long-range sensors excelled at detecting and tracking threats far away. But ground attack under tight rules demanded positive identification and precise timing. The jet now had to hold a laser spot on moving convoys, or read aim points through weather and smoke, while controllers stacked aircraft into narrow windows. It traded pure intercept tactics for strike discipline, where you measured success in coordinates confirmed, not just tracks deterred. A representative Bombcat sortie at night sat at medium altitude to balance threat and fuel. The pilot managed the profile and airspace while the RIO drove the pod, refined coordinates, and cross-checked the target set against the desired weapons effects. They self-laced, called laser on at the basket, and rode the clock through terminal guidance. If a second pass was needed, they reset the geometry and updated the talk on with the controller. That division of labor mattered when radio traffic spiked and the stack compressed. The two crew model reduced task saturation. One aviator held airspeed, deconfliction, and the threat picture. The other worked the sensors, confirmed target identity, and managed weapon settings. It improved accountability because each step in the chain, ID, clearance, laser timing, got an independent cross-check. In complex close air support, that redundancy kept errors from propagating. Then JDAM arrived, weather no longer grounded precision. Coordinates drove the weapon, and the pod helped refine those coordinates when you could see. In poor visibility, the crew still contributed with updates from the radar, the infrared, and the map-to-ground correlation. The combination let the aircraft strike through haze or cloud, and it extended relevance beyond clear nights. Operationally, the jet showed persistence and reach in Balkan policing and later in the early phases of Afghanistan and Iraq, where distances from the carrier were not trivial and time on station mattered. It could push out, orbit, and return with tasking complete rather than just a show of presence. There were trade-offs. The pod added drag and weight. The retrofit demanded new wiring and boxes that did not always play well with older avionics. Reliability did not improve with age. But the mission payoff was obvious when you counted targets serviced per sortie and the reduced need for buddy lacing. By this point, the aircraft had proved multi-mission value even as the sustainment bill kept climbing. Having shown the airframe could adapt, the obvious question is what a purpose-built modernization could have delivered. What if the Tomcat shed drag, gained fuel in its skin, and went digital? Would range and cost finally align? Super Tomcat 21 sat as a mid-life modernization concept rather than a clean sheet fighter. The idea bundled cleaner aerodynamics, digital flight controls, a modernized radar suite, and conformal fuel tanks blended along the shoulders to extend legs without hanging tanks. It aimed to keep the big wing and the two crew workflow but it would remove parasitic drag where the original design had paid for variable sweep with bulky gloves and external stores. The promise ran into procurement reality. To get more thrust and better fuel fraction, you had to re-engineer in multiple domains at once. Structure around the pivots, inlet performance across a wider envelope, and software to tame the handling. That triggered certification risk and a likely growth in unit cost the Navy's acquisition climate favored a lower-risk airframe already on a steady production line rather than a deep refit of a complex jet with unique logistics. Technical proposals followed a straight logic. Engine growth on the F-110 family would push thrust up while holding specific fuel consumption improvements at cruise. Leading edge extensions would add lift at high alpha and shorten takeoff runs. Conformal fuel tanks targeted meaningful internal capacity without the drag and weight penalty of centerline tanks. The radar path went beyond APG-71 with a digital architecture to support higher reliability and better modes, and the cockpit standardized to a glass layout for crew coordination and fewer unique parts. CFTs and control law refinements mattered for endurance math. You lower drag at cruise, you hold subsonic speed with less throttle, and you reduce how often you touch afterburner in climbs and intercepts. That helps fuel and it helps maintenance because fewer thermal cycles and lower vibration loads translate into longer life for lines, pumps, and mounts. The goal was not raw top speed. 
It was sustained crews and repeatable legs with a lighter support burden. Cost modeling in this period tended to reward digital systems that cut boxes and simplify wiring looms. You could argue for lower maintenance man hours per flight hour if fault isolation improved, and if line replaceable units sat behind smart access. But the Delta still had to overcome the variable sweep mechanism, larger footprint, and older structural baseline. And that was a high bar for a program office scoring predictability. Weapon and network growth fit the concept well. AM RAM integration, an improved IRST in a cooled fairing, survivable sensors moved off the nose, and data links tied to joint targeting would have kept the two crew workflow relevant. The RIO station would run fusion and long-range queuing while the pilot managed the energy and deconfliction. The Tomcat's exit signaled a doctrine choice. The fleet prioritized repeatable sortie flow, predictable logistics, and lower maintenance variants over raw reach. The gap did not vanish. It moved. Tanking increased. Standoff weapons took more of the strike load, and uncrewed systems began to shoulder persistence and risk at range. One way or another, the fleet still pays for range. The question is, which airframe carries the bill?